From Minneapolis, Minnesota, welcome to Playwright Center's Theater Begins Here. Today, theater begins with monsters. But first, a membership highlight. Our website is getting a whole new look. This year, we've started spring cleaning in our online space. Playwright Center staff has been busy building a beautiful new website featuring much improved clarity and accessibility, and it's scheduled to launch in early May. Members, your experience with our membership site will not change for the time being. You will still be able to access the Opportunities Board, your play submission trackers, and other materials in the usual way. Just know that some exciting changes are coming in the next few months, and keep your eye on your email for more information. And now, on to the show. C. Meeks Meeker is a playwright, teacher, and podcaster whose work often explores queerness, feminism, and the end of the world. Their plays have been performed and developed across the United States, including the Kennedy Center, Seattle Repertory Theater, San Francisco Playhouse, Annex Theater in Seattle, and About Face in Chicago. They are a Stranger Award Genius nominee and Gregory Award Outstanding New Play nominee. They are a former Jerome Fellow at Playwright Center, an alumna of Seattle Repertory Theater's Writers Group, and former Walter E. Dakin Fellow at Sewanee Writers Conference. They received an MFA in playwriting from University of Iowa's Playwrights Workshop. They currently have a podcast, Rewatching the Walking Dead, co-hosted with fellow playwright Margot Connolly, and they teach at City College of New York. Welcome, Meeks. Hello. We are very excited to have you here today. And uh, we will begin with asking you the sort of basic question we ask everybody first, which is, how did you get into theater? This is very true. I was too scared to do theater in high school, um, but in college, I had a crush on a roommate in my dorm who was going to take tech theater, and I was like, great. (laughs) Um, I too will take tech theater because I've always been interested for no other reason, absolutely no other reason. Um, and, uh, then I just sort of stuck around because as it turns out I really love theater. Um, but I was way too scared to do it in, in high school and in college, I, I really only directed and I stage managed, um, and I did a lot of really terrible lighting designs, um, really bad, really bad lighting designs, um. Uh, my friends will still attest to this to this day that they were terrible, um, but they were very supportive about it at the time. Oh, <laughs> which is great. Always have friends that do that for you. Uh, but mostly I directed and it really wasn't until um, it wasn't until I got out of uh, undergrad and I moved to Seattle that I started writing plays. And it was mostly because I wanted a chance to direct something. And um uh, in that process was like, well, I don't like any of these options of the, these people that they've paired me with, not because they were bad people. They just like weren't writing things I was interested in. So I was like, I'm going to write something that I can direct. And then I wrote something that I really liked. And I was like, maybe I don't want to direct. Maybe I just want to write. Maybe this is the problem. So then I just started writing plays. Like from then on, I was just writing plays constantly. So that's my story. That's my origin yes, story. Yes, I love that. Starts with a crush, ends with playwriting. <laughs> yeah so then when did you decide to fully commit to this as a career God, does anybody actually ever fully commit to it like I feel like we're all in a love-hate relationship with theater constantly um like I'm currently in like an on again off again with it still like I I was like oh I'm not going to write a new play um for a whole year just because I'm mad uh and then like literally two days ago um, I've been having ideas for plays this entire time, but I've just been like, no, I will not write these plays because uh, theater is mean to me right now. And then literally two days ago, I was like, but this play is about werewolves. Like, wouldn't that be fun? Don't you want to? And so I started writing that play. And it's like, <laughs> so committing to it, like I have commitment issues, but also it is the longest commitment that I've ever had. But we also fight a lot. So um, it's it's a little bit of that. And uh, <laughs> it's a little bit of that. Um, but I think like I decided that I wanted to mostly write plays, you know, when you get into that room with a play and with people and you figure out like, oh, this is 
this is this is all like this is all this is about is just about being in this room with people and then watching it go from being in the rehearsal to being on stage which is like the cliche of theater that like that's the magic that happens but it is it's the magic that happens and that's like that's why it's so hard to leave is because you're just like no but I remember that feeling I would like to be in a room again please theater love me again so we can be in a room with people again wouldn't that be wonderful Mm. um so yeah, committing to it is like is a weird way of me <laughs> to think about it because I, I literally broke up with it uh, for six months and then now I'm like being like, okay, we'll try again. Um, but I don't know if I answered your question, but that's my honest answer. <laughs> <laughs> that, I feel like that is really a thing because every single time in my life I, I have said that I am leaving theater, I'm going to do something else. I think I have control and I walk away and then I get pulled in deeper, like much, much deeper. So I, I feel all of those things with you. It is not for the faint of heart. It's not, but yes. all, but also every single person that I know is a commitment phobe and yet they're in theater. And it's just, it's really like, it's really funny that this is, this is a thing that we have committed to. Like we, we don't know how to commit to other people, but we do know how to commit to this thing that doesn't love us back most of the time. <laughs> like we are gluttons for punishment and it's very, I mean, it says a lot about us all, I think. <laughs> it says a lot about the pull of the room, the pull of like the magic of that specific community coming together that is like, even though this is something that doesn't love me back all the time, all I want is that again. Yeah. It says something yeah. about it. Powerful. Even when it's loving you, like you have the production and everything else, the level of stress that goes into it and you know how, you don't know how stressed you are until the lights go down and then you feel that the audience is like anticipating the first line or like the first moment of your play. And then like, it's all over. It's all over in like what, 90 minutes to like two hours. And you're like, man, I'm now relaxed, but I did all of that for like that amount of time. Like I did all of that. I did all of that. And you do it again. Yeah. You'd be willing to do it again over yeah, and over again. You do it. And then on top of that, I will say, like, you know, there's the there's the scenario where you go and it's like, okay, it was very stressful, but at least like I had this opening night. And then there's the opening nights or like the continued runs where you go and you watch your play, and every single time you watch your play, you're just like, Oh man, this I really wish I had done that. I really wish I had done this differently. I should really like so like there's like it's still that, and yet still you just want to come back for it. It's yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't understand. I don't understand this kind of like weird head game that theater plays with you that does that to you, but it really, it tricks you every time. It's like, nope, this time, this time's going to be different. You're going to, we're going to love you. We're going to love you so well. It's going to be so great. (laughs) Well, we regularly ask you to teach about horror and monsters at Playwright Center. Can you talk about your introduction to this genre and what captivates you about it? Uh, So I think I started... I started loving horror as a child. Like I honestly, like it was like a bonding thing that I did with my dad a lot. Like he and I watched a lot of horror movies together, likely when I was too young, but I started reading Anne Rice and Stephen King in, you know, middle school. And like, again, like he was, he was kind of mortified, but he was like, I don't know, kids reading. I don't know what to do about it. It's fine. So like, (laughs) I don't know. I started, I started like with horror from a very, very young age. Um, and, uh, it's always spoken to me and I didn't think that I really understood why until later. And that's really what kind of drove me to start to research it because, you know, the more horror that you watch, the more you start to realize things about yourself and what you're interested in and why you're potentially interested in it. And so for me, um, I started to really unpack like what about this genre speaks specifically to me as a queer person um, right now in this moment. And it, you know, it sends you on all of these, these paths of, because a lot of people have written about this, about why this specifically speaks to not just queer people, but lots of people in general and, and how, how this genre um, has given voice to so many things that uh aren't able to be expressed in other ways or could be expressed potentially in a three hour long drama movie that nobody wants to sit through, but will somehow win all of the Academy Awards versus, well, there's this big monster and we're going to talk about, you know, gentrification. Like it's, it's, but we're not ever actually going to say gentrification. It's just going to be implied, right? Like I think there's, there's something to that, that horror is such this vehicle for metaphor that it becomes this thing that captivates you becomes very captivating for you as a storyteller um, because you're just like, why does it work this way? And how can I use it to tell the story that I want to tell? 
um, that isn't the three hour long boring drama about gentrification and about how well first of all this neighborhood started at this day and this were the people involved and this is how that happened and instead you can just be like ghost boom you know yes i like that you mentioned like it doesn't get the academy award the classic horror movies you can think about are like from the 70s and back and it's just so hard now for a horror movie to get that same recognition or be taken seriously if it's not like this heady type thing people don't want to deal with it and i really love hearing you talk about monsters and how you uh, in monster theory so for the folks that don't love monsters <laughs> um or don't quite know they just know it when they see it how would you define a monster and how can they be used oh god in okay so a monster, I mean, literally like lots of academic articles have been written about what is a monster and how do we define it. So it's, it's, it's a very, um, it's an amorphous thing, but I do like um, Jeffrey Jerome Cohen's like uh, analysis of the monster and what that means. Uh, he wrote, he wrote a very famous article um, called the seven theses of monster theory and specifically talking about like uh, what, like what makes a monster a monster, um, which is very heady, really wonderful, worth the read. Um, if you all have show notes, I can give you the, the link and, you know, you can post it. Um, Elena has been in my class a number of times because we spend quite a bit of time talking about monster theory every single time because it is a mind-blowing read. Um, so, but like very broadly, I think that a monster is specifically something that is otherworldly, whatever that means, because again, that's a very like big term. Um, but it's often of this world. Aliens can be monsters, sure, but generally speaking, it's a, it, it, that it, it feels a little bit more too otherworldly versus like from our particular soil. And I think it being from our particular soil is necessary, um, generally speaking, because it's going to speak to whatever cultural moment that we're in. Um, you know, very famously, we had Godzilla shortly after the atomic bomb, right? Like we had these, like the attack of the 50 foot woman after the atomic bomb too. Like we have these monsters that are speaking to us from a very specific moment in time um, because they were speaking to a very particular feel that, fear that we had. You know, communism gave us body snatchers and like, oh, everybody, your next door neighbor is infected with this idea. And oh, that's, isn't that terrible? Um, the vampire has throughout history been used and reused in so many different ways. Um, you know, first to sort of being this uh, scapegoat of uh, lots of anti-Semitic views. Um, if we're looking specifically at like, Dracula and Nosferatu, like very much like a cartoonish like version of that, but it has been reborn so many times in so many different ways um, that it's it, it's always about its cultural moment. Um, so I think like that's another category for it. And then I think you can talk about like that also sort of translates to like the certain environments that birth. Um, monsters, right? Because we have cryptids all over this country and all over the world. And I love a cryptid story. There's this great book called The United States of Cryptids that really talks about like the mythology of, of local monsters across the United States that I find really fascinating for this reason, because like these are, these are communities that birth this monster for this reason and trying to figure out why is, um, is a fun academic research topic. So that's sort of like broadly what I think a monster is, um, you know, and again, there are seven theses of this, so it, it, it does a lot of things. It's more than just that. So that's very broadly like some, some big swaths of like what monsters uh, are, um, I think, but there's like part of what's so great about them and even, you know, the Cohen article talked about this too, is they do defy categorization. So they're not just those things. They can be lots of things. Um, and I think, the thing that I, I find so great about them from a storytelling point of view is that, you know, the audience is the meaning maker. Like that's like the thing that we're always taught in theater. Like they're the people who like, we can't, we can't tell them what something means. They, they put meaning on it. So the next part of like the storytelling potential then for that is for whatever you put the monster next to is what then people will read on to it. Um, trying to figure out like, yeah, why are those two things in conversation? What are, what is it about them? You know, to go back to the vampire, like the vampire is almost always about sex. 
it's just the way that it works. It's just, they're very sexy. Um, even if it started from an anti-Semitic place, it was still really hot. Like he was biting people's necks and stuff. Like that's what was attractive about it. Um, and people who try to tell you otherwise are lying to you. Um, I really did try to have somebody tell me that that was like not attractive, and, like not sexy at all. And I was like, I don't know. I don't know how to have this conversation with you if you can't come to an understanding that a vampire biting you is hot. Like, I just don't know what to do with that. Um, uh, I just, I feel like we're just on two different planes um, of existence. Uh, so that's the, I think the storytelling potential that's so great is that it really is made in the audience um, and is, is, is a conversation with the audience um, very much about like, well, why do you think this is here? You know, you know, I love to talk about Get Out because Get Out is a zombie movie at its core, like 100% is a zombie movie, but it's talking specifically about like the zombie in a very rebirthed way, in a way that is completely brand new for this particular generation, um, where specifically, you know, the origin of the zombie um, uh, from like the, the, uh, Haitian, uh, country is about, um, people, black people being afraid of being hollowed out and enslaved by white masters. And like, this was a place that of course had the first successful slave revolution. Um, and so this to then happen and get out is exactly what happens in get out where the entire fear for, I think his name is Chris. Uh, and it's a very justified fear is that these people are literally going to hollow out everything that makes him him so that they can control him and have, and be inside his body. Um, so that, I mean, is it a monster movie? Is there a literal monster? No, but there is kind of because like, I don't know, the white people in that movie are pretty monstrous and are are trying to do that. And it's a very fun up like uh, overturn of the genre in that way because um, the zombie isn't who you think it is. It's, it's a complete like reversal. It's the zombie master who has actually always mm. been the monster, of course. It's really fascinating. Wow. Yeah. I don't know if that was word salad or not. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Well, that's a good segue into my next question, which is really about theater versus film. And there are ways, obviously, in film to make monsters incredible. Can you talk about how we can make monsters feel real on a stage when we don't have all of the special effects and stuff that you have in TV and film? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, and, and I've talked about this a lot, too, in the class, like, the thing is, and my cat wants to come join us. Um, yeah. So the thing that makes um, theater different is actually, is, is actually the strength, right? Is um, I don't know if you all remember the cartoon Doug um, from a long time ago before it was taken over by Disney, like when it was severely like a Nickelodeon weirdo show um, because Disney kind of like made everything less weird. But Nickelodeon loved it being weird. Um, and generally what they did, like there was this, this moment that I still remember from Doug where he and his friends are all talking about the same movie and how terrifying this movie was. But it turns out they were all closing their eyes when the monster appears on screen. Yes. Do you remember I this, remember Elena? this episode. Yeah. yeah, they're all actually, they're all lying to each other because they all get too scared and close their eyes during that scene. And what they, what they when Doug finally opens his eyes, he sees that the monster isn't scary at all because you can actually because you can actually just see the zipper um, of the monster costume and he's like oh and then he like he feels kind of superior because these people are still talking about how scary this is and now he doesn't have this fear of it and so I think in a lot of ways um, theater is about taking away that zipper and having that really not be the question the power of theater is that you don't have to see the monster at all um, it's just about the myth of the monster mm -hmm. that can be terrifying and speaking of like there's this great play by Julia Jarko called the terrifying and we don't really get to see the monster in that in that piece like but we get to see the effect of the monster and that's what's really kind of creepy um when i think about the monsters that i've employed too like i very rarely actually have them come on stage because having them on stage is not as effective as our imaginations um, when i was growing up my older sister also really likes horror and so uh there was uh there was one day she's like five years older than me she wanted to watch the movie mm -hmm. seven um, which is not a great movie to watch if you're a kid. Um, arguably does not age well either just because of the people involved in it and all that we know about them now. But um, I still remember that like halfway through that movie, I was so scared. It was a serial killer movie, but like I was so scared and I wanted to stop. And she like, she very frankly looked at me, me as a 10 year old and was like, you can't stop. Like you have to finish it because you have to know the monster's dead. If you go to sleep now, you're gonna have nightmares because the monster's still gonna be there. Um, 
and then she she said something else to me too about how our imaginations are far worse than anything else like that you can actually see and i think that's true so i think that for theater what actually is our greatest strength is to treat it more like fiction um, in that way where you're just like, no, no, no. Like, I'm going to tell you the stories. I'm going to set up the expectation for something terrifying to happen. And then, uh, and then hopefully like that um, dread will just sort of build throughout the whole piece. But then there are several plays that do it successfully where they have, um, you know, supernatural uh, and mystical things happen on stage all the time. And I like those, those plays too. They do it very well. Um, I'm thinking of um, Prince Galmovia's um, Brothers Paranormal um, has a, it's a fantastic horror play that, that really does let you see the horror happening. And those seem like very, very fun tricks. You know, I took, because I, because I had a crush, I took intro to theater tech, but we did an, ex we did, we did a lot of magic props like that, trying to figure out how you make that stuff happen. So I think too, the thing that trips people up and it, about, about writing this stuff is like, well, people aren't going to be able to do it well. And it's like, sure, if you write that there's a monster transformation on stage, that might be really difficult to do if you want to try to have it be a movie moment. But if you're open to puppets, if you're open to um, ways that we can use our theatrical tools, you won't be disappointed. Um, it's when you it's when you try to make theater film that it becomes disappointing. But when you rely on stuff that people aren't expecting to see, like the Brothers Paranormal, where it's like all of a sudden somebody's being levitated up, and it's like, yeah, that's actually like a pretty easy trick to do, but it looks amazing. Or like having um, somebody burst through the wall on stage. Like if you can actually invest the budget to like make that really smooth, it's gonna look really great. It's not, but it's not gonna be the same thing as a film scare. It'll be a lot different. Um, yeah, I talk a lot. I'm so sorry. That's why we invited you to talk about monsters. <laughs> right? Like, it's your job to just geek mm -hmm. out about it right now. And well, just because, like, there's just so many different types of monsters, we're just not going to be able to dive into them the way that, like, literally you could do a whole, like, semester's worth on just one type of monster. Thinking about that, you've mentioned several types. You've talked about zombies, vampires. We've talked about ghosts, werewolves. How do you categorize monsters? You've kind of given like a broad definition because a monster doesn't necessarily need to be like that big scary thing. It can be another human. Yeah. How do you think about the category of monsters? Can I ask a follow up to what end? I'm 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 trying to figure out what you're what you're looking for. Um like do you have magical creatures over here? Mutations right here. Uh, other worlds over here. That's just like the way that I think about it. But I'm wondering how you kind of put things together. If like you put cursed things over here. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I, I don't really, I don't think, I don't think I think about them uh, separating them out for myself that way. But I mean, I think that there's, I think that they each offer different potentials because of that, but then they can all break the rules. That's the other thing that's really great about them is like, you know, um, there'd be, there are definitely people who, who would say that ghosts are not monsters. And I would say that under certain conditions they are and under certain conditions they're not um, just because ghosts tend to be specifically about examining the past, but that doesn't mean that monsters can't also do that. I think like, the 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 difference of being cursed or not is also a really fun distinction if for no other reason than like a lot of mythology of monsters on curse like i mean so i think about like first of all the werewolf starts as a curse right which is also started as like a as a as a as like i mean it has a the werewolf is a very confusing one i think in a lot of ways because of its uh, it like in film what was it its first iteration in film was like the wolf man and it was kind of it was kind of hearkening to the holocaust but it was also saying that it was a curse it was a very cuz he had like a, a star on his palm that was very reminiscent of the six sided star um but then it was a curse and so it was kind of unclear like what what sort of thing it's being drawn to but then i do think of like the fact that a lot of good werewolf stories go into it being a curse and how uh, so is so when I was growing up, it was called the womanly curse, right, of having of having your period. And so then, of course, there's that that's great movie, Ginger Snaps, that's about teen werewolves uh, and they're getting their periods. And that's when it happens. I don't know, like I said, if I've ever really categorized them that particular way, but I think like 
there is something to be said for, you know, the story that you're trying to tell and what kind of um, powers your beast has in a certain way. Like if they have the power of transformation, that's going to speak very differently now than it does, than it did maybe in its, uh, in its, you know, even 20 years ago, I would say um, I have this, this friend, um, uh, Ash, who's been writing this piece for a while about the shapeshifter and trans uh, lore and just like how, um, the shapeshifter as like trans icon essentially um, but then we have like there's this Susan Stryker piece uh, about Frankenstein and transness that is also really interesting she wrote a follow-up to it um, some some years later because it did not age well as these ten things tend not to do yeah yeah I hadn't really thought of categorization but it's an interesting question that's why I was like tell me more Elena about what you're looking for so that I can I can sort of pontificate a little bit about what I'm thinking as you're saying it uh, I mean yeah. I guess it's like I don't know. It depends on if you're thinking about, like you were saying, the powers of them or like what are their traits? Because if you're like, oh, I, uh, my category is like duality, then like, yeah, you have uh, like the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde type thing, which is like an accident. You have a werewolf that's more of a curse. You can have um, shapeshifters where it's just something that runs in your family it's a you have power over it and then thinking about yeah is like how much control you have over that duality versus like like the people like zombies following their id or like they're always like they need the thing to survive and mm -hmm. i would like put like zombies need brain them and then like you have vampires need blood depending on how your theory of witches are like i need children to eat um but also <laughs> Like, I thought the Pied Piper was, like, the most horrifying thing in the world. Because I, like, just assumed that he ate the kids. Like, I was like, you can just steal children. Got sirens on top of that, right? Right. Yeah. Well, that leads to, like, a, I think a good follow-up question, which is, you know, having all these, however you categorize or, or think about monsters, how do you decide which monster to use um, depending on the themes or the questions or, you know, what's going on in your play? Um, I mean, I always go back to the story. And so I love Elena, what you were just saying too, about, um, you know, about, about what you like, what the attributes are and what you want them to do, because depending on the story that you tell or want to tell, you're going to use a different monster. I, 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 I've been thinking about the Pied Piper a lot recently too, because um, it feels like a really good, uh, a good thing to bring to, to like bring into a discussion about gun violence and children, but I haven't figured out specifically like what to do with that, which part of the reason why I'm sharing it on this podcast is like, that's in the ether. I think that's not just me. I think lots of people are thinking about that. Somebody write that play. Cause there's something interesting there. Right. Um, I think like, I always love to think about what a monster, what the monster I'm going to use consumes and if they are what their stance on that consumption is. Right. Because I think like that's always a good place to start in terms of uh, in terms of how it's going to help tell your story and maybe not start, but as a good way to start to think about how to edit and reframe some things, because there are still monsters that I've had in my plays that I haven't ever fully defined. And I don't think you have to fully define them if you're not going to actually show them on stage. You can like their effects are scary enough, like the fact that they can do the things that they do. Um, but it's always a good starting place to just sort of brainstorm out like what what a monster is known for so that then you can figure out how to break from it. Um, the siren is a really great example, right? Because the siren is specifically targeting men and that's fascinating um, in the mythology, right? Uh, but that doesn't mean that has to be yours. Um, the Vampire Diaries did a take on the siren. Yes, I watched the Vampire Diaries. Yes, I even watched that season with the sirens um, because it was very late and not as good as the other seasons, but I did watch it. Um, and, you know, like every, every single person that takes up a monster changes it. And this is part of the reason too, why I think monsters are so fun is because they can really shape any story. So for me, I am always thinking about when I, if I want to use a monster, it's like, what is the monster going to add to the story? How are they going to help me tell the story I want to tell? What's the metaphor going to, what is it going to look like to an outside observer? We can't ever like force an audience to think anything that we want them to think, but we do have an idea of what you know what would be best you know if you um 
this 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 book was really good. The adaptation, the film adaptation, did not do as well. But my best friend's exorcism is fantastic. Uh, the it's a it's 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 a Grady Hendrix is a is, the novel is really good. The movie adaptation, like I said, not so great. But like the whole idea of your friend becoming an entirely different person overnight happens in high school, and this is literally a high school story. Like it just, I mean, it's it's one of those things that happens quite a bit. And so the monster that he chose to talk about that specific alienation is an exorcism, and it's about a demon possession. Like, yeah, totally. I totally felt like there were times when all of a sudden my friends were mad at me and I had no idea why. And they had a completely different read of the situation than I did. And I was like, if you take that one step further to violence and extreme and, you know, you add in a dash of uh, religious trauma, like you've got to, you've got to play. Like, it's great. Um, I feel like I'm not answering your question, but yeah, I mean, I think like, I think, I think that's the thing is like, you just sort of have to always focus on the story. What I tell my students all the time with horror is that, um, They'll forgive anything if the story is good. If they're not scared, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter actually at the end of the day if they're scared. What matters is if you told a good story. And to tell a good story, you have to make sure your elements actually are cohesive and are not fighting against each other. You know, with that story, with with the the whole like your best friend changing into somebody completely that you didn't know, um, there are certain monsters that might not work for that, right? Um, but then like every single thing has like a break that it could do uh, because basically, you know, there's a, um, my Jennifer's body does that exact same story, but it's a succubus like, okay. Like, but, it, and it's also got a lot of like eroticism and very fun stuff. And I'm very excited to see Lisa Frankenstein, which by the time this airs will have come and gone and it's already getting panned. And I'm very, very sad. Um, but Jennifer's body let's remember was also panned when it first came out and Jennifer's body is a classic. So yeah. Ramble, ramble, ramble more, more things <laughs> that I said. I love that. Thank you. <laughs> You have a really, I really love when you talk about it in your class, like anxiety versus fear. Can you talk about that a little bit? Like the difference between those and using them in your storytelling? Yeah, I love, I love anxiety versus fear because um, anxiety is a great engine for storytelling and fear is not. Fear is the jump scare. Fear is this is a thing that's right in front of me and I can see it and it might be scary for a second, but then if I stare too long at it, it's maybe not so scary. Um, Again, you can see the zipper, right? But anxiety is the thing that um, you're worried that's going to happen. You're worried something is going to happen. You are literally Jamie Lee Curtis in Halloween trying to figure out, like, is there somebody in this house? Where's Michael? Where's Michael? Where's Michael? Where's Michael? And we as an audience are feeling that anxiety, too, but it's slightly different. Um, And then, you know, your protagonist is also feeling this anxiety. And then fear is, oh, my God, there's Michael. Attack, attack. Okay, okay, okay. But then, like you're no longer face to face with each other because you run away and you're back to anxiety, which is why it's such a great engine. You can play with anxiety all the time. Anxiety is such a great engine um, for, for storytelling and for not just for horror, but like horror is, is a great use for it. But also like, I think I first started teaching the horror class right before the pandemic. And then I taught it again um, after the pandemic. And I just remember talking about anxiety the first time with people and then talking to them about it like during the pandemic and it was very two different reactions because everybody like I think even if you had never fully experienced it with COVID in those early days of COVID man like everybody was terrified all the time and nobody was allowed to leave their apartment so they were experiencing anxiety in a personal level in a very different way uh so yeah that's my that's my feeling on anxiety versus fear. Um, fear, it's right in front of you. You can attack it. It's it's corporeal, but it's and it's great. You you can use fear like it's a good valve release, you know. Um, but you can't have you can't have moment after moment of fear because it just won't sustain. You'll just you're just standing in front of the monster the whole time. It's not fun. Um, versus, oh my god, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? Mm, it's making me anxious. Just. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah you all play D D with me too it's my I favorite love for playing D D with you <laughs> so. anyone who gets a chance is lucky does the monster always have to be the villain no yeah i don't think so i mean and i think like quite famously we have so many great examples of that um you know to go back to Anne rice uh which is Anne rice is having her moment again i'm very happy she's getting her second moment um you know because she had her moment in the 90s uh with interview and now interview is back again but as a tv show that is like finally as blissfully queer as it can be um 
No, I mean, I think what's great about the the monster, I mean, Candyman 2 is another great example where it's like, I don't know, is is he the villain? It's really kind of unclear. Like, there's definitely reads of that where it's like, he's not. I mean, he's a victim of circumstances too. Like, um, and generally speaking, that's what kind of makes the, the monster really compelling. Um, you know, vampires are kind of compelling because they're trapped in a circumstance that they might not agree with. Um, ghosts often are victims of something that happened to them who then become vicious and angry. Um, demons maybe are pure evil, but you know, then there's good omens. So like, I don't know, like you can, you can have, you get to have like freedom in this way to say that, that your, that your monster doesn't have to be villainous. It's just trying to communicate with you. It's trying to tell you something about yourself that you don't already know, which is, generally speaking, what theater is about is most characters on stage are trying to communicate with each other and to the audience something that they don't already know and they need something from the other person. So, yeah, I don't think that's, yeah, man, that'd be really boring world if every single monster was always a villain. True. To our greener writers or writers that are just being introduced to monsters and thinking about using them in their plays, what advice would you give them? Where's a good place for them to start? Yeah. So I would say like, be brave and just start it. Like figure it, like, especially if you have a monster that you like already, um, you can just start playing around with that monster um, and figuring out like, okay, what is this monster known for? Uh, and try to like, sort of figure out, okay, if, if, if they're known for these things, where do I want to put this monster? Cause you can always deviate. Like I said, the siren can be any, any, any monster can be anything just because it's always been seen in one place. Doesn't mean that's how it, always has to be so i would say start there start with with like the monsters that you're interested in that you want to play with i'm just gonna wait for spike for just a second <laughs> need to say hi to spike he just wants spike. to move my hello mic. spike hi we missed you spike is like we know each other and you haven't even said hello so i'm just gonna keep showing you i'm here uh, he does this too when Margo and I record. He just at some point is just like, you've talked enough. I'm here. You can talk <laughs> to me. Um, so yeah, I would say I would say just sort of starting there, starting with, with a, an, a monster that you're interested in is, is a great place. And then the thing that I honestly tell young writers all the time and most often is if you just wait until it's perfect in your head, it's never going to get written. <laughs> because I will literally sit with people for a long time talking to me about like they have this idea or they have that idea and they just haven't written a single word of it they just have this idea and every single time I'm like great like yeah in theory what you're telling me sounds great you have to play with it like that's the that's the whole point you have to play with it to figure out if it's going to to do anything so the biggest thing that I try to tell my students is like try it try it and nobody's going to make you put that play on if you don't like it. Like Nobody's going to make you keep that scene if you hate it. Nobody's going to, nobody's going to know that you changed monsters four times until you found one you like. And also like, if you go back always to the story that you want to tell and, and maybe the monster doesn't even belong in it at the end of the day, like that's okay. Like as long as you're telling the story that you want to tell, it's worth it. And then, you know, on like the more practical standpoint, you know, definitely start by, reading a lot of things that you're interested in and and reading a lot of these horror plays there's a lot of us um there's more and more of us all the time i'm always shocked to find new horror plays and i'm always thrilled because people will tell you constantly that horror is impossible to stage and it's just not true Um, that is a lazy way of thinking about things Um, it's hard but it's no harder i think than um uh, than any other play it's just you know uh, like a movement play also has difficulty a song with a play with music also has difficulty like a horror play just has a different vernacular but it's it's you know it's the same kind of thing um so just try just try and see what happens and tell the story that you want to tell and if it has a monster in it um great if you just use the monster to get started and then you don't do anything with the monster ever again nobody's gonna know you will and that's it and then also get smart friends who read yes. and tell you. Do you have books that you love or teach from or places you would recommend um, people go to find plays with monsters or horror plays? Yes. So I've mentioned a few of them here that I like. Um you know, there's also this great book called Zombie Theory, a reader, which is just a bunch of academic essays about zombies. I mean, like, here's the thing. I really like academic um, analyses of, of monsters and horror, but that's not everybody's cup of tea. So, like, and it's not necessarily something that you have to do. Um, I just find it interesting. 
Um, there are great books about the about histories of every single monster you can think of. Um, Caliban and the Witch is a great one as well uh, that talks specifically about how the witch hunts happened and why. And, and it gives you some extra perspective on where that mythos comes from because of that origin. So I would say like looking into all of those things is, is fantastic. Um, in terms of plays, New Play Exchange is always a great resource. Um, but I, I have several that I do teach um, in, in my class. Um, but there are some great ones that have just come out, you know, in, um, in Minneapolis, you're going to have one coming very soon uh, from my friend uh, Keiko Green, uh, who's doing Hell's Canyon at Theater Moo, um, which I did read an early draft of. Hell's Canyon is amazing. I'm very excited for it. Um, I think that this will air potentially after that has happened, but hopefully it's getting, it'll get a second production. Uh, my friend Eric Marlin has a great play called Denial, which is a very terrifying horror ghost play. Um, about Holocaust denial. It's it's a trip. It's very intense. It's really amazing. He also has a play about possession. Uh, but these are like New Play Exchange has great search features now. It didn't always and it does now. So I would say if you're like really hungry for like what to read, always start with New Play Exchange. And then um, Aaron Courtney, I recommend Aaron Courtney all the time. Aaron Courtney is a is a highly published playwright. So if you don't have New Play Exchange, but you like have a library, you can find an Aaron Courtney play. Um, she plays with horror in a way that really speaks to me because none of her monsters are visible except when they are, if that makes sense. So she has a few plays that play with that. And then she has like literal monsters that happen. Um, like for instance, in her play Demon Baby, where there's literally just like this gnome that sits on the character's chest and there's no explanation of why this happens. It just continues to happen. And the, ex the, the, la the lack of explanation is what makes that so terrifying because again, we are meaning makers. We're trying to put that together and we're just like, what's going on? And I have a lot of theories about it. And I did finally like try to ask her about it. And she was like, and she was, you know, she's a teacher too. So she was like, mm, mm, mm. and I was like, damn it. I knew you were going to do that to me. And still, I just wanted to know if I was right. Yeah. So I would say like, follow follow those things and 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 sort of see and always like research like if if academia speaks to you great if not like you can also um there's a there's like a a book of like the very big thick book that is just about the history of horror movies and it talks about the different anxieties that spawn them i think it's called monster show that i read very early on um and uh and it gave me a lot of insight um and then of course there's carol clover's really seminal work um women men women and chainsaws which is about the slasher and you know lots of things still play off of her research including scream um, if you like Scream and everybody likes Scream, if you don't like Scream, I really don't know how to have a conversation with you. Um, I did go on a first date recently with somebody who was like, I don't like Scream. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I, like, I, don't know what we're doing I just here. tried showing <laughs> Scream to my 14 year old daughter this Halloween. <laughs> what did she say? She about halfway in, she was so anxious. She's like, I can't watch it anymore. I'm too anxious. <laughs> so, <laughs> she hasn't finished it yet. I'm waiting to finish it. <laughs> I needed okay. Well, she's fourteen. Yeah, I needed your fifteen-year-old sister's, you know, text. Yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You need. You really need a bully of a sister. Except my sister's not a bully. She's wonderful. But you know, like that was you know, trap. I was like, ah, I can't I finish. finish this. She's too anxious. No, Scream is amazing. But yeah, Carol Clover's Men, Women, and Chainsaws is the reason why Scream happened. Like, it's just a meta analysis of of the whole, of the the slasher genre. Um, yeah, I mean, I could go on. There are so many resources. So, like, if you are interested in horror as a storytelling tool, just start reading a bunch of different theory about it, and you will figure out the ones that resonate with you and the ones that you're like, that's a bunch of hokum. Um, but I, I love the word hokum. It's become one of the new words that I have used. <laughs> I'm realizing now I just used it on a syllabus recently. Um, this is a new word for but... me, hokum. <laughs> hokum. <laughs> hokum. Um flim flam. I knew uh, hokey, but hokum. Yeah. I kind of like that. Do you have any other shout outs or like art crushes? You mer you mentioned Erin Courtney. <laughs> I know that you have a huge art crush on her. So and Erin Courtney that. is an affiliated writer at Playwright Center. Right. That's how I got to have a conversation with her. So I was very happy. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I would say like honestly, my art crushes are the people that I've I've mentioned here. Um, I you know Aaron Courtney, Keiko Green, um, Keiko Green and Eric Carlin. Uh, sorry, Eric Marlin are both friends of mine. So it's weird to say that they're also art crushes, but they are. I would also say um, Samuk Davongsai is a fantastic arts crush in Minneapolis who does great work. Um, I was really lucky to work and dramaturg uh, her play Kung Fu Zombie Saga, which is an amazing epic uh, piece of theater. The night that I saw it, she gave away the ending. Of course she did. <laughs> like in the intro speech. And I was like, did you just do that? And she, like, and she was like, oh, I did. I did just give that away. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Stay, stick around. Speaking of my 14-year-old, again, we saw that whole saga. We went and saw the whole thing. And at the beginning, she was like, oh, how long is it? And I was like, it's, you know just hang in there she was riveted she did not want to leave she wanted to tell all her friends about it like it was so good I mean like talk about using monsters really effectively to tell a story Mm -hmm. like uh, her plays are specifically trying to talk about intergenerational drama um in Laos and and using the zombie to do it um but also using very specific cultural moments that really become metaphors and of themselves like it's it's really it's fantastic how she's able to talk about um laos history while also talking about zombies <laughs> she's really great yes. and her zombies do kung fu so why wouldn't you want to you know watch that exactly <laughs> yeah it's amazing well it is officially that time now where we get to ask where does theater begin for you uh i mean theater begins with a crush that's what i heard <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I didn't have an answer I for this question true. until you, until I said that earlier. I was like, okay, I got it. I think I got it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But, and how many people in the world can probably say that, you know, probably a lot. Yeah. <laughs> what, what is also kind of stunning to me about this that I often notice is that Theater begins for people who have crushes on somebody who's already in theater, but the person who sticks with theater is not the original theater person. I will. It's the person who had the crush. I will add that person is no longer in theater. (laughs) See? See? (laughs) Every time. Every time. Happened to me too. Not a crush, but like an invitation from somebody. And then, yeah. And then it gotcha. Mm-hmm. That theater is its own monster. <laughs> Ooh, coming full circle, Elena. I guess I'll go. I think theater begins today for me when you're introduced to something by your parent before you're really maybe age appropriate. <laughs> Literature, when you're too young. That's where theater begins. <laughs> It pairs nicely, too, with you uh, showing your 14-year-old screen. Give it a few years. Yeah. Give it, get a few yeah. years. She'll, yeah. she'll come back. Yes. <laughs> she still can't, speaking of monsters, can't finish Harry Potter. She won't read the books yet. I don't know why. She's decided she wouldn't read the books. We were watching the movies. We got to... I don't want to give this away. Although, don't we all know? We should all know. Um, we should all know. We'll just say Dumbledore in the tower. Got it. <laughs> she cannot. She could not. She couldn't. She just the anticipation. And it was like, I can't watch it anymore. Turn it off. She doesn't know. She doesn't know. <laughs> she doesn't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, the books are more intense. So I feel mm-hmm. like- mm-hmm. There's this woman on Instagram I've been watching and she's like been reading Harry Potter out in the world and she's like sobbing at certain parts or she's like upset and she's just like filming her reactions <laughs> like to certain moments. And I'm like, I don't know why I got to watch you have reactions to your reads. Wasn't it too like Leslie Jones used to just like film herself watching Game of Thrones and I watched that every single time because her reactions oh my were the best reactions. <laughs> And I was always just like, I didn't even watch Game of Thrones. I think the reason I started watching Game of Thrones was because of Leslie Jones' reaction videos to Game of Thrones. She just wanted to know what could incite this kind of impression. Okay, mine is a little bit longer. I have it on a post-it. 
but it just really resonated with me you talking about monsters on our soil like that being the difference between like alien it's like on our soil just it feels so close and it feels like something you could create something that you've run into something that you will have to deal with at some point so it's like a monster is inevitable to come up to you and then you talking about like what you have to wait to the end to see if the monster dies and that made me think about what if it doesn't because that's like also a part of it and so theater begins When we let people imagine the different monsters on our soil and encourage others to wait until the end to see if the monster dies and for them to respond to the call to action when it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Mm. I like that. Somebody's a writer in here. (laughs) (laughs) Hmm. And also writes in this genre. I know. (laughs) Elena (laughs) is also one of my huge arts crushes that I did not mention earlier, but should have. (laughs) <laughs> thank you the first play of Elena's I read which I don't remember the name of was in this genre and it was so spooky and amazing and I loved reading it it's like so it's changed like 50 million different titles so <laughs> yeah but thank you so much for joining us and talking with us shout out to your show podcast will uh post a link to it so people can mm-hmm. listen to you talk about the walking dead uh yes. we are very funny i think we call rick things like dumb donut it's very fun like it's very fun. it's a very <laughs> fun show and then we get like we get really upset at the show a lot that's mostly what the show that the first you know few episodes are it's like man i love this show and also this is terrible look at what they did here <laughs> this is awful why didn't they give her anything to say why are they treating these characters this particular way and then it's like oh right there was a bunch of white men in that room until this amount of time and then then you're like oh look it got so, like so much better look at how that happens isn't that funny almost predictable yeah. <laughs> uh stay safe in the snowstorm thanks for having me Join us for our next episode on May 29th. Let us know on Spotify where theater begins for you. Feel free to send your questions for future episodes to the link in the bio. Thanks for listening to Playwright Center's Theater Begins Here.